All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another week of Football Talk. I'm your host, Charles E. Smith, Jr. This is an Inside Sports production. Fantastic show coming up this week. So let's go ahead and get right into it. As you know, I do not do this show by myself. I need to have some help here, so enlist some of the best talent around in this week, as it is every week. None other than Chris Lardieri of FootballNation.com. You can also follow him on Twitter at Chris L Sports. And without further ado, Chris, what's happening, man? What's the latest out there? Before we get into all this fiasco about you know the refs, the Packers, the league, the referees, all that, what's going on in the world of Chris Lardieri and uh, FootballNation.com? Charles, thank you as always. Um, first and foremost, not a lot of people know this, but uh, you and I had a sort of lockout going on, but... Unlike the NFL and the refs, we, we sat down, we hashed things out, and we're back to work today. So thank you for doing that. Unlike Roger Goodell, cooler heads prevailed. But uh, and on a serious note, uh, my weekly column, FN Follies, you can find on footballnation.com. This week, uh, the title is Upon Further Review, Green Bay Packers Won. And I think that about sums it up. And when I sat down to write this column, there was so much to write about this week. Bill Belichick grabbing a ref. Uh, the Lions melting down in overtime, um, uh, Kevin Ogletree tripping over a replacement ref's hat, Tim Tebow going shirtless, and pretty much all went by the wayside with one play to end the game on Monday night. Exactly, and, you know, we we got to get into that. And I think one thing the NFL is going to learn, which, uh, you know, I probably could have told them or you could have told them, which is uh, no matter how powerful you are, it's really kind of hard to strong-arm part-time employees who actually have other careers, you know? Exactly. I mean, I know they think they have leverage because the economy is still not so hot. But, um, you know, I think Ed Hockley saw that and probably went back to work at uh, being a partner in a law firm and mm-hmm. a lot of other guys working in insurance, sales, et cetera. And, uh, yeah, they, they, it's, it's almost like just the arrogance got the best of the owners and, and the commissioner. Exactly. Now, you know what, let's go ahead and uh, get right into it, That uh, the fiasco that was that uh, Monday night football game with that uh, incredible call at the end, which actually the NFL acknowledged was the wrong call, even though they, they failed to reverse the call or award the game to the Packers, even, and the casinos turned out, the Vegas casinos uh, actually refunded some of the money. Uh, at least one of the casinos did that, so just a horrible call at the end. Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I've had people try and explain it to me. Clutched against his body as his feet come inbounds. And mind you, one of the referees acknowledged it was an interception and right. put his hands up to stop play, while the other one, who didn't have the better angle, called it a touchdown. So... I mean, I, I thought poor John Gruden was going to either jump out of the booth or, or return to coaching. He was so beside himself. It was just really an abomination. Let's hope this is a turning point that, that brings the regular refs back. Exactly. And, you know, the thing is, when you have a simultaneous possession, that will be maintained by the passers, as they say in the, in the rule book, meaning the quarterback and receiver. But if one has possession... Either one has possession, and then someone wrestles it away. Afterwards, it will not be called a simultaneous possession. Not that the ball was ever, that Tate ever really wrestled out of his arms. All he wound up with really was his arm pinned against uh, the defensive back's chest. Exactly, and and let's not forget he uh, practically assaulted poor Sam. That's neither here nor there. But I think uh, Mr. Jennings on the Packers is, uh, is going to learn how to bat the ball down at the end of the game as opposed to going for the interception. I, I think that's one positive that will come out of it. Exactly. Now, and I, I got to say that, you know, that was the most egregious uh, interception, you know, or shall I say, you know, I mean, a non call on a push off that I've seen. I, I think maybe I got to go back to 1976 with Drew Pearson on Nate Wright in that divisional playoff game against the Minnesota Vikings as far as non-calls on crucial plays go. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that was a pretty impressive shove until this. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get into the other games. And we had talked about the Lions uh, a little bit. And this was supposed to be the year. You know, they made the playoffs last year. You're supposed to see some progression 
with teams as they go forward, young teams getting better, learning how to win. But are the Lions taking a step backwards here? Because we saw this game. I mean, they gave up a, a Music City Miracle Part 2. They gave up a 105-yard kickoff return. They were way down. They came back. Then Jim Schwartz's bizarre call in overtime to go for it on fourth and one, down by three, when he could have kicked an easy field goal and, and extended the game, which he tried to explain away later on. Yeah, and I thought it was a pretty pathetic explanation. There was a miscommunication. I mean, it's not like the good old 1970s where, say, Chuck Noll would have to call a play into someone or try and yell it from the sidelines. We've got wireless technology now where you can radio into your quarterback. So um, not quite sure what happened there. Apparently he said they were trying to get the defense to jump off sides, but usually you don't snap the ball when you do that. Um, at the end of the day, my reservations with the Lions, it looks like they're going to come true, and that's on defense. Their secondary is atrocious. They're not getting the pass rush they need, and teams are just slicing and dicing them up. And while they've got a great offense, they've got question marks in the backfield. It seems like a revolving door at running back now. Uh, Stafford seems to have suffered his annual injury. He can't stay upright. Sean Hill's a nice backup, but you're not going to have that high-octane offense like you did last year. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. So you kind of hate to see it because of the uh, all the long-suffering Lions fans out there who finally had themselves a uh, a glimmer of hope. But you know, it is what it is, and they just seem to be digressing. But let's uh, take a look at uh, something else before we get into the patterns and trends of the league. We talk about the spread offenses maybe getting figured out a little bit, but we got to go back uh, to the Thursday game, which kind of gets overlooked on the show because it happens right after the show. Then we got the games. Uh, the Sunday games, then we come out here and do this. But Eli Manning and your Giants, you know, they, they had the big comeback win against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and then they should go into Carolina and just really spank the Panthers. And one thing that came out of this, they got another receiver kind of stepping up, and that's Ramsey's Barden, who came up with uh, nine catches for 138 yards. So... It, it begs the question, when all is said and done, who is going to be the most famous Ramses around? Is it going to be Ramses Barden? Is it going to be Ramses the Pharaoh who established the 19th dynasty? Or is it going to be Ramses the condom? What would you say? <laughs> um, I would go with the second one from a historical perspective. But given the fact that uh, every year it seems as though a uh, receiver emerges out of nowhere in or around week for the Giants last year it was Victor Cruz. I'm hoping it's um, Mr. Ramsey's Barton out of Cal Poly. Um, really impressive game. You know, just reading a lot about him in training camp, there were some people who thought he wasn't even going to make the team. And he, He's a nice big guy. He had a couple catches last year in a regular season game up in New England and mm -hmm. in, in crucial moments, and they thought, oh, he's going to finally break out. Well, he got his chance. He's a big guy, really stepped up with, with the loss of Hakeem Nix last week you know some people were wondering if maybe that would hurt the Giants the Panthers are really key on Cruz well he stepped up big time so I, I think they've got themselves another receiver and now we know why Jerry Reese let Mario Manningham walk in free agency exactly so I, I guess on the when you when you rank them you would take uh, you'd still have to put the Pharaoh Ramseys first with uh, Barden maybe a close second and you would put the uh, the condom in a decided third is that correct uh, yeah, just because I know I've got somewhat of a family show type audience, and you know the kids might be studying a little more history in school as opposed to, let's say, uh, health education. Yeah. So uh, let, 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 let's leave it at that. But um, you know, you, who knows? You might be uh, you might be doing like CNBC and taking some uh, having some guests on when they're really your advertisers. So I'll, I'll leave that up to you to determine the rankings. All right, there we go. But, you know, to me, I think from a marketing standpoint, I see a really easy endorsement ad coming here. But I, I won't even get into that because that's not uh, not my field of expertise. It's all about tie-ins. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and talk about this, though. We talked about the spread offenses and maybe the teams figuring that out as the – as your Giants did in the Super Bowl. And we look at the three highest scoring teams in 2011. We're looking at the, uh, the Packers, the Patriots, the Saints, the highest scoring team. Now this year they have a combined record of three and six after three games. And the point differential, they're only at a plus three in points. 
And the Packers scored 560 points last year. The Saints, 547. The Patriots, 513. And now you see these spread offenses not being able to get off the ground. Definitely. I think we might be onto a trend. And a lot of people in league circles like to say the league's divided into four quarters. You've got essentially your first four games that will encompass the month of September. And at that point in time, you start to see trends emerge. Um, definitely there are two things that come to mind. Number one, no lockout this year. Teams had a lot more time to plan and scheme against the spread offense. Number two, the three teams you mentioned cannot get their running games off the ground. Cedric right. Benson's been just a horribly mediocre at best for the Packers. Um, the Saints, with their kind of revolving door running back, going back to Pierre Thomas, can Mark Ingram do it? The Sproles receiver, is he a running back out of the backfield? And then with the Patriots, I mean, who's who's really going to be the running back there? Is it Ridley? Is that going to go back to the Danny Woodhead? Hard to say, but at the end of the day, you do need some semblance of a running game or teams are just going to key on the pass. You've got to keep defenses off balance. And, you know, talking about balance, let's talk about the uh, balanced offense. Atlanta, Houston, and Arizona. All of them, good running, good running games. Uh, it's good defense, and now here they have a combined record of 9-0, and point differential of 119 in the plus after three games. Yep, there you go. And then on top of that, all three of them are playing outstanding defense. Right. Um, one of the reasons I like, for instance, the Cardinals as my dark horse team this year is they've got a really good defense. They've got a lot of – there are a lot of guys you may not have heard of other than Patrick Peterson. I mean, Daryl Washington's really – coming into his own down there in the desert, just ask Mr. Vic. Um, they swarm, they're aggressive, they force turnovers, and uh, Ken Wisenhunt's really done a good job with Kevin Cobb stepping in for the injured John Skelton of getting him to play, and I, I hate this term, play within himself right. and not try and force the ball and, and make the throws when he needs to, and it's working out. Uh, the Falcons, you know, I think Matty Ice might be coming into his own, and and Michael Turner had a nice game returning to San Diego, definitely keeping the opposing defenses um, on edge, essentially. I mean, you can't key on the pass. You can't key on the run. You don't know what's coming. And the Texans, uh, equally impressive. I mean, we all know they've got mm -hmm. Arian Foster, Ben Tate's an excellent backup coming off the bench. But, I mean, Shaw lit up the, the Broncos secondary, hit Andre Johnson and Kevin Walter. Um, really just an impressive show and, and their defense might be equally as, as somewhat of a, a, a no-name crew. Um, they let Mario Williams go and now J.J. Watts emerges the, the next great defensive lineman in this league. So um, balance on both sides of the ball with all three of those stories. Yeah, definitely. I like the way that the things are going there. So, and, and, you know, the other thing about Arizona is that I think in their last, if we going back to last season, I think in their last 10 games they've only lost, I, I think they have one loss in the last 10 games going back to last season too. Yeah, they really came on in the last seven of eight games last year and it kind of went below the radar. But, um, yeah, they're, uh, they're, they're really clicking right now. And um, even though Beanie Wells is going to be out until – late November, Ryan Williams stepped up as a nice running back. It just seems like they've got depth at a, at a lot of positions there. And uh, Larry Fitzgerald certainly looks like a happy camper these days. <laughs> hey, everybody loves Fitzy. Whether or not you're, you're a fan of the Cardinals, maybe they're a division rival or something, but everybody loves Larry Fitzgerald. Just the, the way he plays the game, the professionalism. In going through all the changes that he's gone through, with them, you know, playing with Kurt Warner, who's one of the best ever at just getting the ball to a receiver, then going to uh, Kevin Cobb, who didn't play so well. He played for Derek Anderson, uh, you know, John Skelton, the whole thing of a revolving door of a lot lesser quarterbacks than he got used to when he came in. But still, you never hear a peep out of him. You never hear him complain or anything. He just comes to work and does his job every single day and every single game. I agree. And uh, there are few individuals on, let's say, the New York Jets and Dallas Cowboys that should follow <laughs> his lead because he's just a uh, very uh, gracious superstar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, speaking of the Jets, they barely beat the Dolphins this week. I'll go ahead and give it to them. But, uh, you know, Darrell Revis now out for the season. So that's really going to hurt them as far as that goes. Reggie Bush goes down with an injury in that game, too, doesn't play for the second half for the Dolphins. But the Jets, 
Uh, how is that ship looking over there, do you think? It looked like they might be taken on water. Then they look okay, but to me, it's still kind of a shaky vessel out there. Yeah, I agree. Um, and it's not going to get any easier this week with the 49ers coming in after a surprising loss to the Vikings. Um, the problem with the Jets is they tried to go to this ground and pound, as Rex likes to call it, and they can't run the ball. Sean Green might not be the back that everyone thought that he was, and thus forcing Sanchez to throw more, and he really just doesn't have the weapons other than Santonio Holmes. And now on the defensive side of the ball, team's got little or no pass rush up front, which is what you need in this league, and they were relying a lot on, on Revis and Cromartie to shut down receivers, and now you know Revis Island is uh, – gone off into the sunset for 2012 and, and they're really going to have to scheme something differently here to salvage his season. Yeah, and the other thing is, is I watched this game against the Dolphins and what I saw was when uh, when Tebow came into the game it seemed to cause at least as much confusion for the Jets as it did for Miami if not more. In fact, it just seemed like uh, Tebow came in and Sanchez just kind of got discombobulated every single time. Yeah, it's almost like a distraction on both sides mm -hmm. of the ball. I agree with you there. And uh, it was almost like they kind of drew up a play in the dirt and ran out there and tried to run it in a hurry. Right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Quite, they're, they're not really utilizing him like, say, the, the Broncos did. i um, not sure what they're going to do there. But they better before the New York media starts uh, circling like sharks looking for blood in the water. <laughs> there you go. Now, before we get to our picks segment, uh, we got to talk about the two running backs we talked about last week. Uh, Chris Johnson on one side for the Titans, and Michael Turner on the other side for the uh, for the for the Falcons. Now, each of them this past week each got 14 carries. Michael Turner, 80 yards in his return to San Diego, getting that big win. Now, you would think that in a in a game like that, the Tennessee and Detroit game, where there was all that all that scoring, all these fantastic moments and comebacks and everything else, you'd think that Chris Johnson in a game like that would have figured prominently somehow. However, Chris Johnson, 14 carries for 24 yards. He did have one run of 13 yards. So if you subtract that, he had 14 carries, or excuse me, 13 carries for 11 yards without that big 13-yard run that he had. But it did boost his season yards per carry average up to a now somewhat robust 1.4 yards per carry. Yeah, I think he just passed uh, William Refrigerator Perry on the all-time list per uh, average per per carry. No, Perry um, got some touchdowns it, it, though. <laughs> yeah, but they only, you know, I think he had a couple two or three yarders, but I think uh, you know those one yarders dragged him down, and he's probably about like one point three five. But um, I digress. Uh, Chris Johnson's just really confounding, and you, you hear and you read more and more about it. I mean, now people are just like, this guy got his big money contract, and and basically mailed it in and now i heard someone else say recently chris johnson is going to ruin it for a lot of young running backs whose contracts are up he's kind mm -hmm. of the poster child for don't pay these guys they don't last long and or they run out of gas so it's really uh it's really just astounding i would have never thought that he would hit the wall this quickly i mean you could probably bring the recently retired with and tomlinson in and he'd have a, a much better average down there in tennessee Right. I've never seen some, it's one thing for someone to get a little bit, you know, to be slightly below standards, but the only time I've seen someone sign a big contract like this and go belly up, the equivalent of this, I got to go to another sport and I got to go back to in the 70s when George Foster hit the uh, hit I think it was 52 home runs for the Reds, then signs with the Mets and was never even heard from after that. That's how far back yeah, I've got to go to get to get a bust of this magnitude after a big muddy contract. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, even uh, even Barry Zito with the San Francisco Giants, uh, right? Somewhat turned it around and is still pitching, albeit not as dumb as he used to be. But mm -hmm. yeah, I remember uh, I remember Foster with the Mets, a complete bust. I think yeah. the uh, the great Dave Kingman uh, out home run him while hitting two twenty <laughs> a pop. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and get to the pick segment and let everybody know that, you know, the pick segment we've been picking every week, and what I'm going to do is total everything up after this week. It'll be the quarter point of the season, and next week I'll go ahead and uh, give everybody the uh, the rundown on 
who's uh, actually ahead in the pick segment. We still don't know what the, what the grand prize is going to be at the end, but it should be something uh, spectacular here as we get into the picks of the week segment. And uh, let's go ahead and get these games up here just a moment. For the okay. record, I, uh, yeah. te I technically, before the debacle with the Packers and the Seahawks, I, I'll, I'll venture to submit that I won my pick of the Patriots beating the Ravens. I saw a video of the reverse angle of that kicked in the game on YouTube, <laughs> and it was wide right. So I'm going to submit that to the to the judges. Well, maybe we should, uh, while we have these replacement refs, everybody should be able to take one mulligan every week and pick that one game where they say, okay, just wash this game out of the pick segment, and it, it just doesn't count. You know, in all seriousness, I read that Vegas is worried, and I addressed this in my column. They're not only afraid that the fans aren't going to bet, but that the professionals, the, the big money guys, are going to hold off till this gets rectified because look at how much money changed hands, how many hundreds of millions of dollars off that one play Monday night. Exactly. Almost a quarter of a billion dollars from what I understand, which uh, that's Amazing. actually a lot, a lot of money. Okay, well, let's, you know, let's uh, talk about two teams. Uh, we talked about those high-powered offenses, two teams that are struggling a little bit. Well, okay, granted, I know Green Bay should be 2-1, and one, but they're 1-2. and two. The New Orleans Saints, 0-3, oh and, and I was sure they were going to win this game this past week with Kansas City going into New Orleans, but sure enough, Kansas City goes in, and the Saints, they can't stop anybody, and I'm beginning to understand more and more why they had to have a bounty program to get those guys to play defense there in New Orleans. But <laughs> New Orleans at 0-3, is it possible they go into Green Bay and come out 0-4 to start the season? Yeah, I was with you. I thought the Saints were going to win even as recently as uh, the fourth quarter of the game on Sunday when I switched over to Jets-Dolphins. Um, I don't see them winning in Lambeau. Maybe if the Packers had come off that tough victory on Monday night, they'd have a shot, but going up to Lambeau is tough enough playing outdoors on the grass, but you, they're walking into a potential buzzsaw with a an inspired Packers team that's just going to be circling the wagons. I, I go Packers. Yeah, and I think the other thing, uh, you look at Aaron Rodgers having gotten sacked eight times in the first uh, in the first half. Now, I'd say that maybe that might not bode well for the Packers, but when I look at the New Orleans Saints defense, which has been, let's go ahead and admit it, gutless and toothless this whole season. I got to go with the Packers also. Packers get to 2-2, two and two, and I think the Saints drop to 0-4, and, four, and uh, a lot of grumbling starts out there in uh, New Orleans. Definitely, and then you'll get people second-guessing as to why they didn't bring Parcells in the coach for a year. I think that'll be the next wave of criticism. <laughs> okay, so how about the – let's go ahead and pick uh, another game here. Minnesota coming off of that, you know, somewhat an inspired win over the Niners, which – and that was a game where I thought the Niners were going to come back at any point, but Minnesota bared down, and they took that game. Minnesota going into Detroit – that's another one. If Minnesota goes into Detroit and beats the Lions, Lions would go to one and three, and you know there you go. The rumblings will start there, and Jim Schwartz would he be needing to polish up his resume or what? Could be. Um, I'm gonna take the Lions because they're at home. I think similarly to the the Packers on a smaller scale, they will uh, rebound from a really tough loss. And uh, even even if Sean Hill's forced into action, I, I, I think, you know, if I had a decent enough arm, I'd probably look good throwing to Calvin Johnson. So I'll, I'll, I'll go with the Lions. They're going to get back in the winning, winning column. All right. Well, I'll tell you, when we look at the Lions, and you had mentioned there's, you know, the Lions' defense just not being what it was last year. And I think as we look at, at Christian Ponder, uh, playing for Minnesota, they're gaining, you know, gaining confidence every week. Uh, Adrian Peterson coming back. I think the Chargers, or excuse me, the uh, Vikings, they go in there into Detroit, used to playing on turf, so that's not going to be an issue. I think they're going to go in and they're going to beat the Lions. I got Detroit, or excuse me, I got Minnesota in this game. Minnesota going up to three and one. Detroit dropping to one and three, and heads hanging low, chins dragging the ground in the Motor City. <laughs> I could see it happening, and I would not be surprised, and especially because Ponder's really starting to play well. A lot of people are taking notice. Absolutely. Christian does give you something to ponder, but you've already made your pick. <laughs> or as Casey Kasem would say, he's ponderous. 
Right, exactly. So what about the, you know, you know what, and if you wonder about the the NFL getting into this uh, this whole debacle with the refs. Now remember, this is the same league that was scheduled this Thursday night game. For the only game that's going to be on, why would you schedule Cleveland and Baltimore? Not that we're going to bother picking that game. This is just one of those type of rhetorical questions. I mean, Cleveland and Baltimore for a national game on a Thursday night. Who, who talk to me. I know. I said the same thing last year when it was Cleveland and the Steelers, and the only interesting thing that came out of that is James Harrison tried to kill Colt McCoy and got caught <laughs> with attempted manslaughter. Um, I really don't know, other than the fact that maybe uh, the NFL Network thinks there's some sort of uh, Art Modell angle to play there. Maybe rest in peace. Like, at the time he scheduled, he was still alive. But um, right, yeah. You know, I so... guess in fair. Just in fairness, you got you got to put the Browns on, so uh, might as well do it in a divisional game as opposed to them playing, say, I don't know, a high school team maybe. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, let's go on for let's you know an, an intriguing pair of uh, one and two teams before we get to the game that I know you really want to pick. But Washington at one and two going against Tampa in Tampa. Washington, of course, losing a rock pole for the season. And, uh, you know, Tampa just not, I don't know, just looking really helter-skelter out there. Yeah, Tampa's uh, defense, which is really kind of touted, and Greg Schiano being a defensive coach, has kind of uh, let them down the last, well, well, they really let them down against the Giants. And against the Cowboys, they couldn't get the stops they need. They are just lucky that Dallas kicked enough field goals to keep it close. But um, I think this is the week they rebound. They get back home. Um, the Redskins' defense looked like a sieve against the, the, the Bengals. Um, Mohamed Sanu from my alma mater, Rutgers, uh, looked great throwing a bomb to A.J. Green. And I think uh, one, of the, one of the bright spots for the Buccaneers is Doug Martin out of the backfield. He's, he's really impressed me. Um, I think Freeman hooks up with Vincent Jackson. who was kind of a non-factor last week, and, and they beat the Skins. And Greg Schiano will not have to contest any kneel downs at the end of the game this week. <laughs> okay, well, you know what? I gotta go. I gotta go against you at this one. Uh, I still, I like RG three. I like his competitiveness. Now, I, I agree that Washington's defense is not the best in the world, but I think they'd be good enough. And against a little bit of a helter skelter Tampa Bay team, um, I like the Redskins to win this game. And to me, it's kind of a coin flip because we don't know we don't know what's going to happen with these two teams, and they're just too kind of uh, too kind of new. And, but i got to go with Washington in this game. Now let's go with the big Sunday night tilt. The New York Giants, 2-1, and one, against the Philadelphia Eagles, who are also 2-1 and one in Philadelphia. Michael Vick coming off yet another horrendous performance, and this time it actually cost his team in Arizona as Arizona thumped him. But the Giants seem to be flying pretty high right now. Definitely, and therefore this game worries me. I, I could see it as being a letdown game for the Giants. Um, the, the one thing I do feel optimistic for as a Giants fan, taking my journalist hat off, um, <laughs> if Michael Vick plays and stays upright, you know you're going to get a few turnovers, and the Giants like to capitalize on those. So as long as the rookie Nick Foles stays on the sideline with his headset, I think that bodes well for the Giants. I don't think it'll be an easy game. These Giants-Eagles games are always close or seem to come down to the wire. Yeah. But uh, I'll, I'll have to, you know, run the risk of jinxing my team. I'm going to pick the Giants. I just think that the Eagles are in disarray right now, mm -hmm. and one more loss, especially a divisional game, and you're going to have the Philly media calling for Andy Reid and or Michael Vick's head. Okay, so I'm, I got to go with you also for all the obvious reasons. I'm going to take the defending champs against Philadelphia, despite the history. I'd say Philadelphia was not playing well enough. They really have not played well all season, even though they won those first two games. And it's all going to come to a head this week. And, you know, quite possibly in for the fifth game, for game five, Philadelphia, you may see Nick Foles starting at quarterback. The Monday night game. Now, this is a hard one again. Who's going to show up? How are the teams going to play? Chicago at Dallas. Cutler on one side. Tony Romo on the other. I'll say this to all you gamblers out there. Just keep your wallet in your pocket. Don't put any money on this game. This is one you're just going to have to watch. And who knows? You may be shaking your head, scratching your head, or clapping. Nobody knows what's going to happen in this game. 
Yeah, um, I'll go on a limb and I'll say I expect to see a lot of sacks. That much I can tell you. <laughs> and uh, there'll be one quarterback who will make faces towards his teammates, and his name is not Tony Romo. That being said, um, you know what? In, in all seriousness, with uh, Matt Forte out, Michael Bush yeah. perhaps stepping in if, if he's entirely healthy, I'm going to go with the Cowboys. I think, they're, uh, I think their defense is finally coming around. Uh, they're going to be heading into a bye week. I'm really impressed with DeMarco Murray. And they're at home, so uh, I'll, I'll pick Dallas, even though uh, it pains me to do so as a Giants fan. But I'm I'm here as a journalist now. I took my Giants hat off. <laughs> okay, so, you know, I got to go with a few too many question marks, even though Dallas is one huge question mark every single week. And we talked about it before. There's no way to – there's no rhyme or reason to the games they win or lose. I, I'm going to go with the Cowboys in this game. I got the Cowboys uh, – Winning this game, who knows, by the narrowest of margins, but got to pick somebody. The coin went up in the air. It came down, came up Cowboys, so that's my pick for this game. Works for me. I, uh, we agree, and I like it. Okay, perfect. So, you know, it's about time to uh, get on out of here. So, Chris, uh, footballnation.com, any uh, little Definitely. tidbits or teasers you want to give everybody for this week's column? Oh. I'll give you one right now. We're, we're going to break news here on, on uh, Inside Sports. Excuse me. You probably didn't hear it in the background, but my little ESPN alert went off, and the owners and officials have reached an agreement. So now we can all safely watch football again and, and gamble on it without fear of it being ruined by former lingerie uh, football league referees. So that's a piece of good news. So. That being said, I won't have to write about replacement reps anymore. Um, like I said earlier, my column this week upon further review, Green Bay Packers won. Hopefully next mm-hmm. week I'll get to kind of do more of my quick hits about all the funny and odd things that happen in the league. Um, as always, follow me on Twitter, Chris L. Sports. You can contact me there. Um, you, if you follow me, I greatly appreciate it. I kind of throw some humorous takes on the NFL out there on Twitter. All right, perfect. And, you know, everybody, uh, Inside Sports, you can follow me at The Inside Sports, and we'll be back next week. In fact, you know, they had to get this thing settled because, I, you know, I don't like to brag about having any pull or power. However, you know, I am headed to Arizona to watch the Dolphins and Cardinals play. And I had sent a, I'd sent a text out to Goodell, and I said, hey, you know, I'm not, I don't plan on sitting in that stadium for four and a half hours while they uh, try to figure out the rules of NFL football. I'm there to see a game. You know, he tweeted me back. He, he sent me a text back. He said, I got this, dog, and here we go. We just broke the news, homie. Did he do that handshake like he did with, uh, I forget who the, the draft pick was. I believe it was, uh, he was with the Chargers. Did he rehearse that with you before you, you, you two talked? Uh, no, he didn't, but, you know, I'll probably see him in Arizona, so, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit. Well, that's good. Uh, Send my regards to the man who looks like a a Ken doll but runs a multi-billion dollar enterprise. (laughs) Hey, sometimes that's all it takes. (laughs) You know, it's all about the looks. That's right. Well, enjoy your trip to Arizona. It's a a great stadium, and I love it. And uh, uh, definitely, I'm I'm sure you'll have a good time. And um, do me a favor, tell Joe Philbin to start calling some better plays for Tannehill. You know, he kind of took the heat last week for yeah. some of the passes he threw, but I, I think it was highly questionable that the plays they were calling in a, in a game like that, trying to tie it up and win in overtime. So uh, it'll be good. Well, there's some growing pains definitely all around. I, I think for Tannehill as a quarterback, for the Dolphins at a team, and also for, for Philbin as a coach. So we're seeing that. And actually, I thought it would be like that this year. Maybe next year or the year after the Dolphins might be able to, uh, you know, seriously make some playoff noise or something. Definitely. And, and you know, just tell Dan Carpenter to, to stop hooking field goals, and I think he'll be all right. Well, he's kicking indoors, so he, he won't be able to blame the wind. So who knows? Maybe maybe uh, he'll be able to kick it at least semi-straight this time. Yeah, or he could just blame it on the dry heat. He could. <laughs> all right, everybody. <laughs> so that's it for this show. This is an Inside Sports production of Football Talk. For Chris Lardieri, I'm Charles E. Smith, Jr., and we'll see everybody next week. Thanks for joining us.